I was born in 1958 up in Tui. Uh, my father was Stanley Bruce Langford. Um, he originated from Takaka. Uh, he, so there was basically two branches of the Langfords over there, with one in Bainham. Dad's part come from Katinga. That's where he was born. And in, when he was about 20 years old, he bought a farm up in Tui. I think somehow Uncle Nelson was involved with it as well. Um, developed that into like a dairy farm. And um, I remember him telling a story about uh, for his 21st birthday, he went home for his 21st birthday, rode a push bike back to Takaka, and that itself had a few stories to it. Like um, heading off, he got down to the bottom of the Takaka hill and thought he'd done pretty well, but going up, she's getting a bit tight, pressure wise. And then the truck went crawling past as they always would have in that day, and he hooked onto the back of it and got a tow to the top. Truck driver probably never even knew. And um, going down the other side, his brakes weren't going to hold. He could tell that when he's only just barely started. So he hooked some manuka trees on the back of it to hold her back. And he said that was a bit of fun going down with that going on behind. So it's a story I always remember him telling. Um, but uh, yeah, so him and Uncle Nelson milked cows up there for a while. But Dad didn't like that alarm clock in the morning. So he didn't milk cows for too long. From there on, uh, he got invited to a... Uh, a, a day up at the lakes, I think the boat races are on or something like that, by uh, Derry Carson and his wife. Um, and up there he met Alexa um, Emily Bunting, who at the time I think was the postmistress at the Kareri post, uh, post shop. So uh, she was, um, I, I never even met her parents, they all died well before I was born. Um, but she had a sister, Auntie Jenny and uh, Ron Bunting. So. Uh, so they got together, and from there on, um, we sort of got a little family developed up of six kids. So it started off with Claire, my older sister, or she's up in Dargaville at the moment. Um, she married Roger Hemans, um, they've got two kids up there, and um, she's still up there, so uh, she went uh, from training school, basically, uh, teacher's training college up to there. A um, couple of little jobs around here, and then moved up there. And then comes Ruth. Um, she's now in Richmond, and, um, got two two little boys, young Keith and young Tim. Uh, then Bruce um, come along, so he's the next one on the line. Um, he's now over in Blenheim, he, he's uh, qualified as an A-grade mechanic in, at uh, Ian McConkie Motors in town. Um, then started up his own business in conjunction with Ruth's husband Murray Upson, um, Tapware Automotive and Mechanical. Operated that for some time, and then um, after that moved off up uh, as a marriage blew apart, and he moved off up to um, uh, Uriti Valley up in um, New Plymouth. Um, then came back from there to Blenheim, where he's got a farm over there, and he's operating trucks, carting salt, and just general cartage. Then there's myself, which is a different story, goes on for a fair while. I was born in 1958. Younger brother Alan come along later. He's got um, four kids. There's first Bryce, then Rory, then Dylan, Dylan and then Sable. And then the youngest one, all Lindsay. And um, he's now down, at, uh, sorry, Alan's over in Aussie, working over there, um, on contract now for uh, busy cardboard running trucks for them he's got. Two trucks on the go at the moment. He's driving one and Dylan drives the other. Lindsay, he's, uh, he did a bit of work around here, quite a bit of sharing and that sort of stuff. Um, then he's moved down Canterbury Way. He's now in Oxford and he's got five kids. I have to look at remember this. We've got Isabel, Maggie, Hannah, Hazel and Jody. Right. So I got that right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. So that's my family, um, kids, uh, brothers and sisters. Um, so growing up in Tui was um, was great. It was really great. Like I, I've, I'm more of a country person than a town person. Like living in Belgrove, I still feel like a townie. But um, yeah, Tui was a little bit out there. Um, it was a a bit of excitement when a car comes up the road because the traffic wasn't that much. We're sort of looking at the school bus would go up and down twice on each weekday. Um, the grocery van would come up every second Wednesday and the mailman went up once every day on the weekdays. 
other than that you might have seen two three vehicles a day go through so it's always who's that what are they doing <laughs> so it was pretty pretty good pretty good life really um i love the farm life it was um you know the old man he um he'd have you out there helping on the farm and at the time you'd think oh god do i really have to do this i don't really want to do this but we actually enjoyed it once we got into it if we decided to but uh yeah and he's, he's a good dad um a lot, a lot of little antics happened up there though um not like he wasn't involved in any of them either a um, couple of memorable ones as I guess we had an old Dodge truck and I was just allowed to drive this thing on the road at this stage and um, it had um, like an advanced retard on it so you could pull the retard lever around and she'd backfire and never had any exhaust on it and no floorboards in it and I thought I was going to scare him one day we come up over the rise to the house and we had the little dog on the seat beside me and the old man on the other side there and I come up over the rise and let the throttle off, pulled the retard lever around. If it didn't go off straight away, you knew it was going to be a really good one. And it didn't. And she saved it and saved it. And actually, blah, 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 and all these flames come up through the floorboards, set fire to the seat. And <laughs> I thought, wow, this is pretty good. And the old man looked at me and said, did you enjoy that one? <laughs> so lots of little fun things like that happened. Um, well, Dodge has probably got a lot of stories to tell, but she, she came along later in the life. It was probably more the time when I was allowed to get up and down the road in the vehicle myself, normally under supervision or something like that. But um, we'll be here for a long time if we start talking about those things. I suppose um, one of the memorable, another memorable thing, we had a neighbour up the road, oh, Johnny Robertson was his name. Um, he'd been fought in Gallipoli and he bought the little batch off the old man at the top of the farm there way before I ever come along and um, I, I don't really know much history on how he even turned up there or anything like that um, but um, he was an interesting old man um, and he, he, he had the front room of his house was like a little workshop and he used to make little projects up there and um, I used to go up and mow his lawn for him I think we used to get about 10 cents a time to mow his lawn and he'd take us out, the, the house was on quite a little bluff straight down to the Tadmore River below it and he used to throw his food scraps, we'd go out there and we'd throw his food scraps over the side and feed the eels but that, that's a different story but um, he'd, he'd quite often um, get me out in the shed with him and, and we'd make little things and he ended up, we turned out he's making a water wheel for me, um, we'd made the little cups for the water wheel and then we put jars on the end of it lined with rubber and we'd set that thing up in the creek and put stones in it with a little paint, grinding paste and that and it would leave it running and take months but it would polish these stones up nice and shiny um, if of course the flood didn't wash it away and you go and put it back in again but, uh, so there's a lot of that sort of stuff happening he's quite a quite a gem of a man um, and yeah, if you want to go finding him he's in the Tapwera Cemetery look for a lime rock up there that's his headstone so uh, but uh, I understand when he died he was in the proximity of 98 or 99 I hear but no one really knew his age. He just sort of turned up. There's no real family history, you know, family contact from anywhere. I do believe he had kids. I don't really know anything about them. He's a very, very reclusive man. But it was a lot of fun to be had with that old fella. You know, I sort of learnt there that um, not all old people, and to be fair, he's probably younger than I am now when this was all happening. <laughs> so no, not all old people are boring. Um, but uh, I guess to take that story a bit further, the feeding the eels, um, we had the Boyds living next door to us. Um, there's a lot of stories there, some I probably shouldn't say because they weren't very legal. But uh, one in particular, Ian Boyd, the youngest one, and brother Bruce were swimming in Robbie's Hole, which is the pool I was talking about where we chucked the food for the eels. And right over on the bank there's a little ledge under the water, about a foot or 18 inches deep, and Bruce and Ian had swung out, swam over there and they are standing on this ledge. And, Ian looked down and he said to Bruce, oh, that log beside you is not a log, it's an eel, you know. And Bruce, oh, yeah, laughed, and they both laughed, thinking that was a good little joke, until the log moved. And then Bruce did some aquaplaning across the water pretty flat out, but Ian couldn't swim, and he's dog paddling along and laughing and sinking and coming back up and <laughs> scared the crap out of both of them, really. But the eel didn't care, he was, he was just a playful, inquisitive little eel, really. Quite a big little eel, but yes, and there was a lot of them in the pool. That uh, we used, once we got a bit older, we was allowed to go swimming up there by ourselves, and these things that swim around us never used to worry us. Yeah, so that uh, covers old Johnny Robertson.
Um, he, he actually, um, Sister Ruth had a really, really good relationship with him. Um, when she moved up north, they used to um, write to each other. And I can remember going up there to Moab's lawn and he shows me this letter he's got from Sister Ruth. And it was to Foot Rot Flats, care of Johnny Robertson, Cork or Ardy to Wakefield. So, so there's a lot of this sort of humour used to go on. So um, he was a great old man. He was really invaluable, probably to all of us kids. It was just, you know, probably the only person we saw on a regular basis to, to a certain extent. God, Tui. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, um, when when I guess go back on the farm, but when Dad bought it, it had um, it was quite a large block. I don't know its acre, full acreage, but he ended up keeping 430 acres of it. Um, there was Cat Creek in the top side of Donald Creek area up behind it, which was all rough block, and um, I'm guessing it would have been late 60s or maybe near 19. You know, it would have been late 60s, probably 66 or 8, somewhere around there, he sold that to the forestry. Um, and then, um, uh, we, we, you know, before that we used to go spotlighting up there and all sorts of shit. Um, but yeah, it was quite a big bit of excitement when you have this HD16 and a D7 bulldozer turn up and, and start tearing into this place and developing. It was quite educational to watch that happening. You just didn't realise there was these machines out there even and at that age. And by today's standards, they're pretty small, but they look pretty big in them days. So, um, yeah. So um, that uh, farm was on that till nineteen. He owned it nineteen seventy two. I think he sold it. He's farmed it from another about four, year, three years after that. Um, and he'd bought uh, the Clark Valley block, which is basically from the Kareri cuttings up to the, uh, the Hope Saddle, um, and it used to belong to my mum's uncles, so that was Tez, Ashley and Gordon Palmer. Um, they, the last of them died, Tez had died, um, so Dad bought that farm. I think, I can remember, he paid, was it 21000 for it? something like that, so it's about the price of an average sort of car nowadays, um, 630 acres, um, and he sold the 432 acres in Tui to Deaton Newman, who wasn't planning to move out here straight away, um, that was probably one of the first times in my life I ever saw my mum turn white, was when he turned up to pay the 35000 for the farm, with a suitcase full of cash. Poor old mum was just gobsmacked, <laughs> it's very white, but I had the pleasure of doing that to you once again later on in life, but um, yeah, so he paid in cash for that farm, and then um, Dad farmed that for, um, until 1974, when he'd built the, he built the house on the farm in Clark Valley, and we moved over to that, and Basil, Dad Basil Hodgkinson leased it for a year after that, until Dean and Newman come over from Aussie, but um, Clark Valley, that was a different experience for us. First year was there, the place had been locked up for probably, I don't know, quite some time anyway from when old um, Tez finally died, the, the stock had been got rid of and the, and the farm had just been shut up and there was grass everywhere, man alive, hay, just, we are making hay, we had uh, John Hunter I think it was from, come down from Murchison, he was sort of a son-in-law to Codge Gibbs who's around the opposite way there came down and he helped us um, bail, you know, bail all this hay like we didn't know what the paddocks were we were diving into or anything, there's just long grass everywhere but um, man a lot of fun doing that, a lot of fun. Um, there was always, I, I'd never seen people walking up and down the road like I don't know what's going on but there's hitchhikers everywhere, you know, be groups of them going up and, and one day we had some of them jump the fence, oh can we help? And next we had this probably I don't know, six or eight of them, and they were running around chucking hay, they didn't have a clue what they were doing, but it was a lot of fun, and, and they actually were quite helpful. And we got the got that lot done a lot earlier than we probably would have, so the old man invites them back, and we have a little feed with them, and and they stayed camped under the oak trees there for the night, and it's just amazing, these people just pop out the woodwork, and it, you, you wouldn't even see that nowadays. And, um, but you know, for for me, I was still getting used to the fact there's more than two cars a day going up the road. You know, <laughs> and um, yeah. So uh, John Boyd, this is the next oldest of the Boyd fellas. He he spent 
quite a quite a bit of time over there helping us and he thought we can have a lot of fun with this and so he made up a mask out of an old car tube and it was sort of fold over his head with little slots cut in it and we'd always be riding on the back of the truck holding on the headboard going up this road and there's always cars coming up behind me turn around and go like that and hit them and the cars and hit the brakes and <laughs> lots it's just it was just different sort of humour like I don't think these kids were used to you know people coming up the road were used to these country kids in their games Ian Boyd he walks to the back of the truck and he's a piss off the back of the truck <laughs> it's just, just I don't think these people knew what they were in for going up that road. I really don't. But um, that's uh, it was good fun. A lot of good fun. Yep. Yep. And Claire was always quite involved. She used to be hanging around and she'd often drive the truck. And man, life was um, probably, probably a bit insulting to the poor lady, but I can remember one time she'd just get in there and go, you know, and we'd, John and I were on the back in this particular time and those bales were coming up pretty quick and it was bloody hot and we thought, stuff this or just sit down and the bales would come up the bale loaders it was like a bale on the side of a truck and she'd just pick the hay up and come up and you'd grab it off the top and stack it so we sat down she goes round and round the paddock about three or four times and the hay was going up over and dropping down and she'd go around until she realised she's killing the same tracks again all and all the time <laughs> thought the truck should have been full but it wasn't yeah it was only about half full so then we got back up and finished the job but um Yes, yeah, so there's lots of it. Uh, some of it is yes, that you look back and it could have been a bit nasty, but to us it was just really humour at the time. But yeah, I still took, couldn't get over the traffic. That, that just blew me away. It, it just didn't really so many vehicles existed. And um, so, um, and, and I can remember the first night we slept in the old house in the Clark Valley and just get to bed and crash out. About two o'clock in the morning, this holy bloody racket starts up. And think, what the hell's that? And it's happening every morning, so you go out and have a look. And it's all these about two or three trucks going through, and it was the TNL coal trucks bringing coal up from the coast of the hospital, and um, or whatever they supplied coal for up here. But and these had Jacob brakes on, and so I never even knew these things existed. Sure as hell, learnt it over there. But um, and and out just out from where the um, house was to put some perspective on it, like you had a nice run straight. You know, straight from the Hope Saddle down, good downhill, gentle downhill grade, but right where the house was was the Clark River where it dropped off down and over a bridge. So they always sort of hammered the brakes back a wee bit there, so the truck went over revving end into the bridge, I think was what it's all about, but right outside the house, a bit of a, a bit of a way you up. After being there for a week, a month or two, you didn't even hear it. You just got used to it. I guess I started school, I can still remember being forced onto the bus for the first of second, third, fourth, hundredth time, didn't really like school, I just went there to eat my lunch and um, had no interest in it whatsoever, I just couldn't work out why I was wasting my time there, right from the start of school to the end of it really, um, just I'd rather would have been out at home doing something different, But um, so therefore I probably wasn't a model student, um, there was a few times I can remember where I definitely was called not one. Um, and probably one of the, the main ones. Once I got got older, a bit older, and um, got my license, and actually started taking a vehicle to school occasionally, I thought might have some beers down behind the rifle range. That used to happen occasionally, and so you'd head off up to the pub in the old forty-seven Chev and grab your dozen of DB for eight bucks, and take it down behind the rifle range and have a little drinkies. And this went on for a little bit. And one day I was heading up to the pub. There's Two or three, couple of three of us in the old truck and coming around towards the Kahata and the barman was out in front signalling us to go around behind the pub. And I thought, what's this all about? You know, so we go around there and we give him the money and he gives the beers and so what's going on? He said, Oh, deputy principal's in the bar waiting for you. So we headed off back down the road and um, back in my days, about halfway down towards the school, and I look in the mirror and there's this bloody purple holding station wagon follow me. Thought, well, this is not going to be much fun stopping at the school here. So we carried on past the school, went down under the Tapwera Bridge, and the Holden followed us. And I wonder how to go across the river. So we went across the river, and the Holden followed us. I thought, well, it's doing not too bad. But on the other side of the river, it got a bit stony, and the old Shebe was bouncing up over the stones, and the Holden was doing the same. And looking in the rear view mirror, and oh, Holden seems to be stopped, and there's some blue smoke coming out from under the back guards, so we thought we'll just pop back across the river and shot off up the river and come out by Tracy Rogers 
um, tobacco sheds and had a couple of beers there and back to school. About two o'clock in the afternoon, our deputy principal comes in this class, all wet, not looking very friggin' happy. Um, I don't think they'd end too happily for us from memory, but it's, um, <laughs> it's still fun while it happened. Um, and going further on into that, uh, school cert time, I paid my fees to do school certificate. And just before we were due to do school certificate, there was a, a block of raspberries needed cutting out, which was pretty late in the year to be cutting out raspberries, but someone had leased the particular block, so John Boyd and I decided we are going to do these raspberries, and did that, got them all cut out, and then I went back to school, and school suit was only by the time a month or so away, and old Mr Nicholson comes up to me and says, we're not going to let you sit school suit, and I, why the hell not? And he says, well, you haven't been attending school properly. And like mum and dad didn't know anyway because I was they thought I was going to school, which it wasn't. But um, so it was going to be a bit embarrassing. I said, no, "I'm bloody going to," and he said, "No, you're not." And I think there's some reverse psychology going on here because I did sit it, and that's probably all he's trying to get me to do anyway. Um, but as I said, I couldn't. I just couldn't be stuffed with school. I did a, I think a grand total of I think eighteen percent pass fail, should I say, in English. Um, about forty nine percent in social studies, so <laughs> someone said get a recount of no bugger that because it might be worse. <laughs> but um, we had a, a teacher turn up from school. He was a fellow. He was um, came out from Nelson every day. His name was Colin Barry, and for some reason I related to him. He's a bloody drip, and I think that's probably why. But he turned up every day. He had nice silver holding Monaro, and instead of parking it with the other teachers' cars, he used to come around and park under the trees out behind his block. You know the block he taught in, and got on really well with him. Um, and he said, "Oh, you don't like maths, do you?" And I said, "No, I can't get a grip on this trying to multiply and add and subtract numbers and letters. It just doesn't get me." He said, "Well." This year, they're going to start, or next year when you do school cert, they're going to be starting a Nelson Marlborough Maths Certificate, which is common sense maths. Reckon you could do that. Don't know. I wasn't really interested in trying, but anyway, he related to me, which is probably all I ever needed all the way through school, and um, he, he got me into the gist of it. And um, So I sat that Nelson Marlborough Maths Certificate and did 97% passing it. They ducked me 3% because I couldn't work out how I got three of the answers. So got it all right, but I could do maths in my head real easy. It was just second nature to me. Um, so I think with the right people we can change some kids. Um, but yeah, school was school was definitely a, a different experience. It was um, I can't remember a whole lot about it that I actually enjoyed other than the antics we got up to while I was there. Um, there's another instance there was um, a little bit of smoking used to happen at school um, and um, I can remember the teacher singing oh I must be coming right because I bought one of them slide rules I don't know if anyone's they wouldn't even know what a slide rule is nowadays do you know what a slide rule is no no it's um, it's just a, a bloody it's got a cursor on it and you've got a thing you can slide out and you can actually multiply on it subdivide it it's it's like a um, it's like a like a slide out calculator type thing. It all sorts of um, things on it, but it come in this little case, a white case, and you pull the end off it and pull the slide ruler out. You know, you could fit twenty cigarettes in that case. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought that was a pretty cool thing. And um, anyway, that's all good. We had um, uh, an incident one day in the woodwork room where some smoke started coming out of the woodwork room and um, so we had to vacate pretty quickly and someone rushed in there with a fire extinguisher and they'd come out with this builder's apron which was smoking away furiously and it had something to do with a fellow called Hemi Hikariah and I, I think I've heard rumours he's dead now but he's a, the Hikariah boys were a bit of fun at school um, and he was having a little smoke in the woodwork room when a teacher came in so he chucked the smoke out in this bloody builder's apron and thought he'd got it out but he hadn't so that was almost quite an exciting day well it actually was quite an exciting day but it's almost very eventful along with it um, so uh, quite a bit of that goes on um, of course I was never the naughty one I was just somewhere near it most of the time but um, 
another time we had uh, having a little drinky sessions behind the um, behind the rifle range and um, a fellow called Colin Furness we got down to number 12 bottle which meant you couldn't just pop the top off of the other ones unless you thought far enough he'd put the top back on it but he said oh, I can do this and like that and just open it well the top broke off the bottle didn't it and cut his lip blood was going everywhere and I thought now this is going to require a little bit of medical attention so we come up with actually a little bit of a plan where he was opening a um, lemon and pyro bottle just in case they find some some brown glass in there <laughs> like they're not going to smell it are they <laughs> so um, that's all good that was the story but then there's a couple of girls I won't mention names because one of them's still in the area but um, they decide they're going to produce some evidence of what happened and they went and got a coca-cola bottle and they did take the top off it they managed to get it to come off in the same way and put some blood on it and produce this is what happened you know well the teacher's already been told it was a lemon and pyro bottle so straight away the rat was smelt and um, they established most of the people that, who was there and um, four out of the five of us got suspended and no one would you know because they there was Stuart Langford there no right because I was the one that used to get the stuff from so um I never got in it and I was singing all the way home like bastards you know four got suspended and I've missed out <laughs> but as I got close to home I thought it's probably not a bad thing because I don't think I'd like to face the old man <laughs> if I'd been suspended from school so I sort of came at peace with this a little bit as we got closer to home by the time I got off the bus I was very at peace with it so um yeah, she would have been a bit of a um, bit of a horrible situation. I think it would have been gutting for the old man for a starter in the old one. So, so I avoided suspension all the way through school, which was a friggin' miracle, really. But, um, yeah, so um, school life, that's probably... No, we haven't got all day, have we? So um, moving on from school, left home sort of and I went and boyd, boarded with John Boyd and I'd got a job at Shirtcliffs um, working in the lime works and lime quarry um, so it was my first job and um, I was getting 40 bucks a week on wages and um, that was the only time in my life I've been on wages as such um, I did briefly later on for a couple of weeks but um, then far preferred working on contract to be honest because you could just do what you want, when you want, where you want, and um, that. But yeah, it was educational, the first job actually out there supporting myself, and um, working in the quarry was probably more fun than working in the lime works. Uh, working in the lime works was, um, ba bulk of my work there was um, breaking up rocks with a hammer, so they go, they had like a grizzly set of grizzly bass railway lines, that if the rocks had to get small enough to go through that before the they'd be small enough that the crusher would handle them. Um, so if we didn't have a good blast and the rocks um, came in a bit big, I'd be smashing these rocks up with a hammer. And it was hard work, it was hard work. Um, and I had old Golly Harris was operating the line works itself and he, he could get fired up. And um, we used to spark off, sometimes we get on really good and other days we just he, he, he just couldn't seem to do anything to please him, you know, and I don't know whether he was the problem or I was the problem, but um, anyway, I thought I had it pretty worked out. Once I'd been there for a fair while, I worked out that rocks have grain, so you could hit them in a certain way and they'd come off in, in sheets almost, and um, so you do that, and then you let it go down through the bars that bounce off the back of the... Um, the chute and it would actually you'd get him so the fire straight through the hole into the crusher and she could just go boom and stop the crusher well that used to get him fairly excited and it wasn't safe to go down there after you'd done that I only did it a couple of times but it was just to prove that I could he could give me what shit he likes but I will come back um, but in, in general most of the time we got on pretty good um, but so that was the hard work part of it. I guess the one day I did enjoy, I'd been into town one night, had uh, Pam Harris with me, and I can't remember who else was in the old PA Vauxhall, but we're coming out by where Kentucky Fried is there, and there's this bloody shiny thing on the road waving a torch around, and 
thought I'd better stop and talk to him as a bloody cop. And he was telling me I was being naughty because I was doing 40 mile an hour in a 30 mile an hour area. And gave me a freaking ticket for it. And um, I thought it was quite interesting because he's going around, the, the Warren of Fitness sticker was on the left hand side of these cars in them days and Pam was sitting there in a long skirt and she had chucked the bottles of beer up in his, <laughs> under his skirt while he's having a look for the bloody, um, <laughs> for, the, for the Warren of Fitness sticker. But to be fair, like, we talk a lot about drinking here but I never ever drank enough to get drunk in them days. I'd have a beer in that but I was never getting pissed or anything like that. Um, and that come a lot later in life but, um, but anyway I got this ticket and um, it pissed me off you know I thought what the hell's a cop doing writing out tickets at one o'clock in the morning for anyway should have been away in bed but um, so next day on the Monday I back up at works at Shirtlifts and I, believe me every bloody rock looked like it had a policeman's helmet on eh? I gave it assholes so <laughs> I enjoyed that day um, but also the part of the, another part of that job I really loved was um, was working in the quarry. Like sometimes I'd be able to go up there and um, like I don't like heights now at all. But back in them days, didn't worry me at all. And um, and they had this old drilling rig was on a hooked on the back of a little Fiat dozer. The bluff on the quarry is about forty five feet high, which is bugger if I know in meters. It's bloody twelve twelve thirteen fourteen meters high, I suppose. Um, and the above it was quite a steep piece of lime rocky stuff and this old bulldozer would be hung up there with the drilling rig behind it and to make the drilling go a bit faster it was my job to hop up on top of the motor of the drilling rig and ride it down and they could just lift it back up with me on put the next tube in and do it and I think I should love to see that shit nowadays but I, I just didn't used to mind it you know and they thought it paid my wages pretty well because it probably doubled the speed the thing went down at um, so we'd drill sort of I think from memory about 8 to 10 holes uh, sort of like 100 mil hole down for the full depth to the floor where the quarry is and then um, then comes the fun part you fill these holes up with nitroprils soaked in diesel so you have like I think be about a 20 or 30 kilo bag of nitro it's just nitrogen fertiliser plastic bag and you'd tear the top off each, put them in the back of the old PA, PA box and tear a corner off, pour a gallon of diesel on each one, take her up the quarry and then pull them out and pour them down the hole with a, and put a block of um, plug of gel ignite at the bottom and drop a half in every now and again up with cordex hooking the whole lot together and tamp the tops and set her off and this, if it went really really wrong there was a big loud bang and shit went everywhere. But if it went a good blast, it was, yeah, sure it went off with a bang, but it was more of a thump. And the whole face would just come out and drop down. And I used to love them ones because there wasn't much banging or rock, smashing the rocks to do, but the ones where they went bang, you knew I had a bloody hard few weeks in front of me. Um, but um, there's one particular blast we did. Um, we heard this awful bang go off, and I saw shit going up in the air, and I thought, oops, the top had blown out of one, so I shot him. It was down by the magazine, which was probably... 20 or 30 metres from the quarry, maybe in a bit more. And I thought I'll just get under this diesel tank because God knows where this is going to come down. The next thing, all this white shit went all over the road beside me. I thought, hell's that? And I look out and I'd blown the window out of the old TK Bedford. So, so it was probably a good thing I got under the tank. It did rattle a wee bit there. So, um, yep, stories here, they could go on forever again. Same old things. So, the old TD18, the motor popped on that. So, um, that was a motor would probably weigh a tonne and a half or something like that out of the old bulldozer and we used to use that for running the compressor for run the drilling rig. So I took that down to the workshop and rebuilt it and um, put it on the back of the old TK Bedford to take it back up there and no such thing as strapping the bastard on was there. And a uh, fellow Ken Simpson was driving the truck heading back up the quarry and um, heard this thump 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 what's going on looking at the back and the bloody motor had slipped off the back and was in the middle of the road. So I head off up the quarry and get the little drop, come down, lift it up. Yeah, look, didn't seem to be much broken on it, so on the bloody truck it went back up and we tied it on there for the rest of the trip. And um, put her in. I think we had to replace a broken filter or two or something like that, but it just went. So, yeah, but yeah, she's a different story to nowadays. You'd think probably a bit more about that stuff, but it wasn't our motor. It didn't really matter too much to us, I suppose, really, but... Um, 
Yeah, I can't remember who put it. it. Might have even been Barry put it on himself. I can't remember. But yeah, so that was that was that job. Um, so I said it's the only full time job I ever had. After that, um, I just went pretty much into just working wherever there was work. Um, I'd already bought my first truck. I think I was in my late 15, 16 year olds at this stage. I'd bought an old um, AS148 international truck, about a three tonner. So I did a wee bit of contracting with that. Um, and a fella, Clary Thornton, used to live in a house opposite Ian Galatley's and um, Val Griffiths. And, and he'd gone and died on us, the bugger. And he was an interesting old character too, but went to have a party at his place one night and said, we're going to have a party here tonight, Clary. And there's John Boyd and myself and a few others involved. And he said, am I invited? Well, of course you are. You know? <laughs> so but anyway, he turns around and dies. And um, so I rang Sid Phillips up and said, oh, what's happened to Clary's house? I thought we think I might burn it down. I said, would you rent it out? Oh, yeah, we'd rent it out. So we rented that. Or I did. Um, two bucks a week. And um, moved in. We opened the front door and moved in. And quite some time later, I moved out and we shut it again. So it's always open. And um, a lot of... They did burn that house down there. It's probably a good thing, because if the walls could talk, it'd be a bloody hell of a story. But... Um, from there, I, was, I did a lot of work for Ian Galatley across the road in the, in the raspberries. Um, I was uh, driving a bulldozer for Kelvin Holmes, and I uh, started off on a TD9 power shift, the one of the first yellow ones, um, electric start jobbies. Um, did quite a bit of work uh, breaking in hills all over the place. Um, bit of roading, uh, bit of root raking, all that sort of stuff. And... Um, yeah, the whole lot tied in together. Um, one of the purposes of buying the trucks truck was to cart hay, so I was doing a lot of hay carting um, during the summer. So it was quite busy. The summer time was very busy. Um, so I'd be over the summer time. I'd get up in the morning and shift irrigation pipes for the raspberries. Work with the raspberry garden through the day. Load the raspberries out at night, and then head off and cart hay till whenever we finished. Um, and then get up in the morning. Quite often I'd be surviving on three, four hours sleep a night at most. Um, especially when you come home and bloody hell the house is full of friggin' raspberry pickers. Um, and they'd be wanting to party up and I'd be thinking, well I'm actually just about buggered. But um, And um, the reason it turned out they were there was because Jim Hunt, who used to board with me, went over and he cut the TV aerial cable on the raspberry batch so there's no TV there so I'd come over to my place to watch telly. <laughs> and, uh, but of course come midnight the old Kiwi used to go to bed and they'd still be there. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of fun days there, a lot of stuff. There. We'd be here for a long time talking about that shit. But, um, so uh, yeah, the, yeah the summer was all about work and really not a whole lot of playing like all these other fellas were swooping around with raspberry pickers and I was like no no I've got to get this work done I'm going to make some money. Never bloody did but it felt good trying. Um, but um, yeah, so that um, uh, raspberries with Ian Galatley, that was an amazing man to work for, really um, fully understanding of how I worked. Um, and he worked in with us well. Uh, but what he did start doing, and, and it, it must have cost him a lot of money, he was one of the groundbreakers on getting mechanised raspberry picking going. Um, so we were, um, there was uh, a couple. There was um, a couple of universities down in Christchurch were working on it. Um, I can remember one turned up from, God, I can't remember Lincoln University, and they'd developed this machine which would pick horizontal. So instead of having the raspberries growing up like that, that we used to made made framework up so you could train them out like that. Then you pull the canes out, and this machine would go and shake it. Was very very efficient picking because the 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 raspberries would drop straight onto the machine. It did. It actually didn't drop any. But it was bloody expensive and took up a lot of space to farm the raspberries like that. So that that was the downside of it. Um, and then they had another um, another one of the universities, and it was a Pico machine they called it. And the bloody thing, it was like a good idea, but it wasn't built by bloody engineers. It was built by university students, I think, because you'd be driving along and next thing the bloody wheel would fall back and be on great big 
arms come down like all the machine work was up the top and it would drop down from that and the wheels would just bend out yeah, next thing your thing's laying on its side in the paddock just about because it just wasn't the, the m m machine side it was good but the engineering route was bloody hopeless so that was all um, but they had um, one of the best machines that came in was a trailing one um, and that had come in from the states I think um, and it was towed behind a 574 International with a hydro gearbox on it so you, it was tractor drawn and that went really well um, but yeah it was a lot of fun it was you know a, a lot of um, field days were hid, held there and it was just a lot of fun I got right into that um, and, you know like cutting out raspberries like Ian had worked for me there whenever I wanted it really he was um, and, and he could work around all the other shit I was doing at the time so you know because I'd quite often be off with the old international and I bought an old Fordson tractor with a loader it off, off the shirt cliffs and um, no power steering or anything like that, we don't have any luxuries but that was my loader. Um, and I'd be grabbing cow races and all sorts of stuff in the international during the off season so um, and that was really how I operated there for most of those years um, and then um, I did silage, uh, we had some bright spark come through from Murchison selling these bloody jugulars, uh, accumulators and, and palers so the farmer could buy this thing and hook it on behind the hay baler and stack the hay up into groups of eight. Now the uh, uh, um, impaler thing would go on the front loader and just pick these groups of eight and he'd stuck it on the tractor and then take it and stack it in the shed. So going from cutting sort of 30 odd thousand bales of hay a year that year we went down to about five or six because most of these farmers they bought these machines and there was no need for this hay carter fella anymore. And I thought, oh, this is a bit, a bit bad. I was, like I was certainly I was going to survive on the bloody raspberry shit and stuff like that, but it was a bit depressing. And I got a phone call from the branch saying, your truck got a hoist on it? I said, yep, cool, do you want to cut some silage for us? And this is a start to a whole new tangent in the business. Um, so I went up and I did a couple of years for them. Um, and we'd be knocking out sort of anywhere for four to five hundred, six hundred hours a year chopping silage and um, of, of cutting time. And uh, he rung up, Murray rings up one day, and or just before the start of this one season, and he says, Oh, could you find an extra driver or two? And I said, Oh, yep, good, bring him in the morning. So I went there and I get there and I said, We don't want to do silage anymore, we're farmers. So the gear's there, take it away, we'll ring the jobs through as they come through, and we'll see you at the end of the season. Um, so I thought, that's different. And he says, if you want to do silage next year, he says, you have a choice whether you um, get your own gear and do it yourself, or whether you just carry and use our gear. We're happy either way. They're beautiful people, these fellas, you know, absolutely top. But um, that, was a, that was probably my big break in the agricultural contracting world. Um, so I did the season for them and I think we knocked out something like 600 odd hours for that year in chopping time, which is a fair bit to cram into eight weeks. Um, but um, I made the choice I was going to go on my own next year. Um, so uh, later on that year I go for a little bit of a drive down to uh, Winchester to a friend's wedding, or Ian Boyd's wedding, which surprised me even he got married, but that's what he did. While I was there, we went drive about, and I drove through a place called Pleasant Point. Pleasant Point. And bugging me down, there's an old David Brown 121212 on the side of the road with a force hail sign on it, and the phone number. So stopped and had a look at it, and oh, bloody hell, it's got this hydro shift, you know, four hydraulic gears in a row, a bit different than the old 1200 I'd used to been driving with. You've got bloody gears that's going like this. 3,300 hours on the clock, and I thought, hmm, looks all right. So we ring this fella up, and the phone number was on it and he says oh I said what do you want for it and he says oh about three grand I thought shit that's bloody cheap you know really for what it is I was expecting to pay probably five grand for an old 1200 which is only half the tractor and um, so I said well how do we do this and he says oh have you got any money on you I've got about 20 bucks or something like that in my pocket well if you want to buy it he said chuck that in the letterbox we'll call that bloody the deposit and let us know when you can come down and pick her up. So we did that. And um, come home and um, a week or so later, Bruce and I head back down to the old man's TK Bedford and pick her up and stupidly backed it on the truck instead of drove it on the truck and 
come on home with it. And halfway home, I was looking in the shed, and I thought, that doesn't look bloody right. And stopped and had a look, and <laughs> because it had backed it on, it had a cab on it, had a fiberglass lit top on the tractor, and the wind pressure had blown the roof off. So <laughs> that was gone, so I thought, oh, there's not much can do about it now. I kept on going, made up a tin roof for it, and it's actually quite a lot better than the fiberglass one because we insulated it, and it wasn't anywhere near as hot. So. All that, but yes, that old girl did me well. Um, so, and I bought a brand new silage chopper. Um, and interestingly enough, there, there again, um, I bought it through Andrews and Bevan, who were in Richmond. Um, and they uh, says, Oh, yep, the fella Paul Hewitt, I think, was the real estate, I mean, the machinery agent. And he used to go to Tapuera School. And so, oh, well, I've actually got another one coming in as well. and so they ordered them and I was driving into town one day and I saw these two choppers lined up on the bloody front of the Andrews and Bevan. I thought, oh, that must be it. She's a flashy looking piece of kit than it was even in the pictures, you know, and I'd already bought the bloody thing. And, um, well, told them I'd take it. It was all money, you know, borrow money and shit, but um, it's all good in those two. And I never thought much much about where the other one was going, but um, that ended up turning up to go to my Uncle Walter's, who's over in Takaka. So we'd both bought the same choppers, identical choppers at the same time. Yeah, so, um, and that was a bloody good little chopper. Um, so we got going the next year and um, thought, this is it, this is it. And Labor Day comes and we thought, well, we'd better start. It's a pretty dry sort of a year. So we normally, like with the blanches, we'd tend to be working further up the valleys and that. So it wasn't, we'd start a bit later and, you know, it was normally good growth and that, but. So we get going and bloody hell, it was just dry as hell and, and we had what in our Nino system, which they're talking about us getting this year, but ain't nothing like it. By Labor weekend, the grass was dried off and um, she was a bit of a devastating season really. So uh, instead of 600 hours, we did the same acreage in 62 hours and um, that left me up shit as ditch a little bit. So uh, I was thinking, shit, what do I do? So I canvassed all the farmers, you know, see what works ahead and Bloody hell, there wasn't much around. So um, I thought, shit, what do we do? What do we do? And um, this Ian Boyd fellow was down in Timaru doing firewood. And he said, well, if you want to come down here, you could deliver firewood to, you know, around the Timaru area. So no work with the farmers. So um, so this um, sort of downturn in the work in the area was... Um, was decided to go down um, to Winchester and deliver firewood with the employed. Um, so we loaded up the little mini on the back of the car. Um, by this time I'd hooked up with a lady called Hilary Bird and um, so we put the wee mini on the back and we had the, all their stuff stacked in it and off we go in the little old 1952 MLC Bedford heading for Winchester. and. Um, it was a lot of fun, even the trip was a lot of fun. We had a cat, Sneakers, he came with us, and a dog was raising for Noel Stratford. And it was a weird looking little thing, but we were just raising it as a pup, give it back to him when we got back from down there. Um, uh, Sneakers, the cat, he travelled very well in any vehicle. He, he loved travelling. Um, but I think um, by the time we got down to um, just the side of Colwood and we stopped there for a bit of a break and the cat got out and bolted. I think he thought he'd been in the vehicle for too long. Um, and all the way down, this bloody pup was sitting up on the seat behind me because he's only a little pup, and that's how he travelled best. Um, we were getting tooted at every, by every bugger as we was going down and thinking, what the hell is this all about? But we'd forgotten in the mini, it was backed onto the truck facing off, and we'd had a little pink panther and we'd tied it to the steering wheel. So, <laughs> just for a bit of humour. Um... But as we was getting closer and closer to Winchester, the truck was getting slower and slower and slower and she wasn't too happy. Um, and um, there was a bit of a story behind even buying the truck, but um, it had ended up with a partial fuel block and um, and she was starving fuel and it got us there, but that's all it did. She wasn't didn't even start the next morning, she was poked. Um, so before we even could start, we had to get another motor for the truck and did that and dropped her in a and then was into doing our firewood. Um, that was um, quite a, an eventful part of our life. It was, um, we didn't want to be there. Um, we had to be there. And uh, we were living in a house in a happy settlement road, um, which is just off the, off the side from Urari in Winchester. We got another motor in the truck and then we decided, right, we're off. 
and first block of trees we go to have a look at a bunch of pines and Ian and I were in the bloody trees having a look around thinking oh yeah these are right and next thing we hear the squeak and the girls start yelling and carrying on and we thought what the hell's going on here so we go out and there's deer and oh Ian was just running across the paddock so he got the shotgun and peppered it up the arse and we're chasing this fucking thing around went down the Orari river and um, while I was chasing I saw this big fish in the river and I thought anyway Bug of that, we're chasing the deer, and it ran right back across there, so we, we would started chasing it, and it got away. So I was a bit pissed off about that, so I thought, we'll go and get the fish. So we went down this bloody hole and dropped a couple of plugs of jelly in it, and they went bump, and um, there was more than one fish in that hole, like they are flapping over the bloody stones everywhere. So probably more than one or two plugs, and um, but we got the fish. And Ian was standing there holding it, like he's standing up, holding it like that, his nose was touching the ground. And um, it was a huge bloody thing, and it was a trout, but had pink flesh. And man, we got sick of fucking fish, like when we finished that, because we had, you know, we couldn't keep it at no freeze or anything like that. So we'd, we, all we were eating was this bloody fish the whole time. Got absolutely sick of it. Turns out that um, trout and salmon will cross, and they'll hybrid, and they'll grow bloody big. And that's probably, apparently, what it was. So, because um, it was pink flesh but a trout, it looked like a trout, so that was, that was the theory anyway. So that was the start of it, we cut down these pines and then um, had a bloke was advertising oak trees to be taken away, and thought, sounds good, so it was just around the corner, we go and have a talk to him, it was about an acre and a bit of these oak trees, and they were all planted, like they were plantation oaks, they were about four feet through at, at each one, thought, oh, wonder what they'd be like for firewood. So um, we got into those and knocked them down and um, and they actually dried out pretty quick, like the set just run out of them, you could burn them quite quickly and it was amazing. In fact when you load the truck up you'd have to get it loaded up, get it out before the ground underneath got so wet you couldn't get the truck and get stuck in it. Um, so that was all good and um, anyway I was heading in there one day and we had um, we had a, a two and a half quarter pine on the truck, so it was heaped up in the middle and going over the Tamuka Bridge and this bloody um, cop pulls us over and says, oh, you'd be overloaded, wouldn't you? And I said, oh, I don't think so. And he says, oh, I reckon you might be. Well, it's only pine. And he's, oh. Okay, on your way. So away I went. And the next day we're carting oak and we pulled in and we had two quarter of oak on, which was fucking heavy. And um, and there was a couple of blocks on the back that had been cut the day before, and all the sap had run out, and they quite light, you know, quite lost a lot of colour in that. And the cop stops her. Um, oh, sorry, it was the oak was first. Sorry, um, and he says, um, on this load, he, he stops us, and he says, oh, oh, you'd be overweight, wouldn't you? And I said, oh no, no, it's only two cord, and it's not that heavy, and oh, it'd be pretty heavy, wouldn't it? No, 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 and I grabbed this dried block off the back, and he. He thought, oh, it's not as bad after all. And, you know, I'll chuck it back up on top so he couldn't see the difference in colour. He's all right, see you later. And um, so that was all good. Um, got away with that one. And the sap was running through the deck. And I thought, geez, he's got to notice that. But he didn't. And um, away we go. And the next day he was there again. That's with the pine. We had two and a half quarter pine on. That was heaped up. And he stops. We've got you this time. He says, you're way overloaded. And I says, no, no, no. I said, this is pine. It's a whole lot lighter than gum, uh, than the oak was yesterday. Oh yeah, I suppose it would be. See you later. Pardon me, I was overloaded both times. But uh, but we got stopped, I think, seven or eight times while I was down there in that truck. You know, and more often than not, they're stopping us to have a look at the old truck because, like, she was, even for that day, she was a bloody old truck. Had her painted up, not looking too bad. But the other time, the cops would stop you and they think, "What the hell is it this time?" Oh, I just wanted to look at the truck, you know. <laughs> so it was pretty cool. But um, the poor old thing, it wasn't up to the job we were doing with it. Um, uh, she was just really too old. I think we blew about three motors and the whole time was down there and each time it'd be bloody two or three hundred bucks for another motor, which is just what we didn't need. And one day I was driving down the road and there's this old J1 Bedford on the side of the road and they had a sign on it wrecking. So I stopped and had to talk to the bloke and I said, oh, what's the motor like? And I thought, oh, it goes okay. Would you sell it? Oh, I'd sell it. <laughs> so um, 
I said, well, I'll buy it off you. What do you want for it? And he's, oh, would a hundred bucks be all right? And I was, a hundred bucks would be quite all right. So if I buy another motor, I won't need it. Was what I was thinking. But um, so anyway, I said, when you um, once you get the motor out, just put a sign on that the motor's sold or something like that, so I know to stop and grab it. And I was going down the road, and the sign was on the back, motor sold. So stop in. And I give him his hundred bucks, and he says, "Oh, felt a bit bad about charging so much, so he's chucked the gearbox in as well." So took that off and chucked it in the shed at home and or where I was staying. And um, bugger me days, about a week or two later, she popped another motor. So in with this other one. Well, J motor is a whole lot different machine. It transformed the truck. She pulled like a fourteen-year-old schoolboy after that one went in, and. Um, it, yeah, it was really just went and went and went. You know, high pressure crank, all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, so we started towing Ian's trailer into Timuru then. So we had two cord on the truck and three cord on this little bloody trailer behind it. Well, it's like a tandem back axle, the turntable under the front. So made it work a little bit, but hell, you could get some wood into town. We weren't going to tie it up many of the hills though. But, um, yeah, so it was... Um, it was quite interesting stuff, um, and these oak trees I was talking about, um, we were getting three average three to three and a half cord out of them before we got to the first branch. Uh, it was amazing stuff. You look at something, you're cutting stuff that's like four foot odd through into blocks sort of 12 to 13 inches long, and you think, how am I going to split these? But it split beautifully. It was just nice straight grain stuff, really easy wood, real easy wood to, to do. Um, so that's it and then um, Ian decides there's another tree there we'd better go and have a look at so we go and have a look at this and it's a bloody monstrous pine tree and um, thought okay and by this time I thought we probably need the tra my tractor down here because I don't like borrowing other people's gear so I'd rung, rung young Alan up and said would you drive it down or we'll drive up and we'll meet you and oh no, 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 he says, oh, I'll borrow a truck and come down. It didn't make sense to me because the tractor's going to do sort of like 20 odd mile an hour and the truck loader's going to do 40. I couldn't see the sense, but he, he decided he brings it down on a truck anyway, long story short. And um, so just as well he did because this tree was, um, we had a, only had a five foot bar on the chainsaw and it wasn't going to go right through where we could reach it by any stretch of the imagination. So we're standing up on the front of the tractor with this chainsaw and we cut the scarf in and then got round and cut the back cut on it and it still didn't seem to be wanting to fall over and um, we hadn't reached right in but we drove a couple of wedges in and after a while you could see the gap start to open up and away it went and we cleared an area I think it was 140 feet we worked out how high it was she went 30 feet out the end of it and man when it come down the ground just shook so it's 13 feet through where we cut it and um this bloody possum comes out really days looking he was about halfway up so he, he obviously had a rough ride to the bottom that's good we thought this is pretty amazing and next thing all these people in socks and sandals turned up and they were telling us that we were really naughty bastards because this tree was a protected tree and supposedly the biggest pine tree in the southern hemisphere well it's not now but um, they were getting quite grumpy, very grumpy in fact. And, um, and Ian of course was not one to take shit from anyone. And I could see this was looking like it could get a wee bit messy. Um, because they were getting wild, he was getting frantic and I thought, how are we going to sort this out? So I said, look, I'll tell you, tell you what, we'll make a deal with you. I said, we'll bugger off and if you want to save the tree, I said, you can stand it back up, do whatever you like. But if it's still laying there and no one's here to stop us in the morning, we're going to cut her up for firewood. And, and they, oh, yeah, yeah, rightio. And I said, yeah, in the truck, piss off, we're gone, you know. So we're getting in the truck and we're heading back up, because it was only about two or three hundred metres from where I was living. And um, and Ian, we're halfway home and Ian says, what'd you just tell him, wankers? And I said, I said, if they can stand it back up and no one's here to stop us in the morning, we can cut her up for firewood. They can't stand it back up. I know, but they're trying to work it out how they can at the moment, aren't they? And <laughs> we haven't wound up in a bloody big bunch up, have we? Should we go back and tell them? I said, no, I don't think we will. Just leave it. You know, so um, that's all good. Next day we go back down there and no one there. 
so we launched into cutting it up. And um, I think we sold 54, 55 quarter wood out of that tree before we left, and there's a shitload left when we come home. Um, but that, oh, look, it was just full of bloody entertainment, that whole trip. Like, we, it was in amongst a bunch, a bunch of sycamores. Um, so we'd advertise sycamore wood so we could cut a track round and make money doing it. And people were buying it, uh, so we could get round to where the tree was with the truck. And um, so we did that, and then um, we cut a piece about 15 feet long off on this log, off the butt of it, and we put a cut down into it with a saw as far as we could get, put 18 plugs of jelly in and tamped it up tight and lit the fuse and got back waiting for this big bang and it just went boomph. Well, that sounded like a bit of a dud, but the whole ground shook when it happened. It was quite obviously quite powerful. And um, so we got in there and thought, oh, and started cutting sections off it and it just shook the whole log and you just cut it and just break it off and chuck it on the truck. It was actually not bad going. And the next morning old Barry Risman who was up the lived next door to us, and they, they were lifesavers to be honest for us down there because it was a highly stressful time but beautiful neighbours, really made it good. But um, comes down the next morning and he had all his late carving cows down the bottom end of the farm and he comes over and says, that wasn't a bad blast yesterday and oh why is that Barry? He says, well all our late carvers carved last night. <laughs> so brought them on but it was a lot, of, a lot of fun down there the whole time. There's always something bloody different happening and, and Ian, he was a scoundrel I guess. He was a likeable rogue as best you could describe it but because he had an old J1, J2 Bedford and it had a hotted up 327 Chevron motor in it and he come home one night and says oh I think we'll change the motor over on the Bedford and put the six cylinder back in it. Oh yeah okay we should do that tomorrow. No no we'll do it tonight. So we can all bloody night hauling this motor out put the six cylinder motor in it. The next morning he parked it on the side of the road, took our car home, he's living out at Rangatata and next morning it's bang 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 on the door and he says do cops there? What do you want? Oh, oh, is that your truck across the road? And I said, red one is. Oh, about the green and yellow one? No, no, not mine. Do you mind if we have a look at it? Well, you can have a look at it. I says, you know, you always want to be polite to the cops because they can do you some damage. And um, so anyway, they go back in and say, oh, um, can we, have you got the keys here for it? And I said, oh, the keys will be in it. Oh, Okay. Do you mind if we have a look at it? Well, you can have a look at it, you know. And you know, they come back in the third time and it's Can we take it for a drive? I says, look, mate, it's not my bloody truck. I can't tell you you can take it for a drive. If you insist on it, I don't, I don't really know where I stand here. So whose is it? And I said, it belongs to Ian Boyd. Oh, I thought so, yeah. So anyway, in the end they bugger off. And I thought, what the hell's that all about? I've changed the motor on it last night, now we've got cops looking all over it. A wee while later Ian turns up. I says, Ian, why the hell would the cops have been looking at that truck? Changed the motor last night, I was starting to smell something a bit fishy here. Oh, well, he says, I got pulled up by one of the fuzz last night. He says, doing 110 mile an hour. And he said, so I stopped, and the cop, he's written me the ticket out. <laughs> no, sorry, no, he didn't write the ticket out. He says, um, I told him, um, no, I wasn't doing 110 mile an hour. And the cop says, you were. And he said, no, I wasn't. And he said, well, I'm going to write you out a ticket. So I told the cop, you wouldn't be so bloody stupid as to do that. He said, J2 Bedford's only good for 70 mile an hour flat out. And you're trying to book me for 110. The, cop, the judge is going to know you're stuffed up. <laughs> and, uh, so that's why the motor came out. So he could get off his big, bloody big fine. So it would have been a bit interesting. But that Ian Boyd character, it just goes on and on and on with him. Um, another trip we had a, a trailer and we took it up to Christchurch to give to take it up for one of his relatives, we'll call it a relative radio. Right then we get there and it's oh I wanted a red one not a blue one oh it just so happens we've got red paint in the back we scratch all the blue paint off it and paint it red for him and then bugger off home and heading down through Hines the trailer on the side of the road to the flat tyre and then it's oh that's a good little trailer we'll grab that oh no we fucking won't mate that's stealing you know wasn't having a bar of that but um, there again, same two cops come back a day or two later and says, oh, um, that Ian Boyd, where is he? And I says, oh, I don't know, he's, he lives out Rangatata, Rangatata way. Do you see much of him? Oh, sometimes. <laughs> you know, 
anyway, um, well, he rented a hut trailer from Mary Hill Service Station, and um, he claims it's been stolen. <laughs> Fuck's sake, that's a blue trailer, by the way. <laughs> So now we work out that we've been involved in this. Seven years has gone, and the statute of limitations. I'm not prosecutable now. Eh? But um, so um, turns out we've assisted in the bloody stealing and getting rid of a bloody trailer. Um, and then the cop says, "Do you, you wouldn't know anything about a trailer that's been stolen up from Hinesway, would you?" And I, oh, for fuck's sake, no, I don't. <laughs> so you must have gone back and got it. Uh, the cup about a week or so later he's wanting to advertise this bloody trailer using my phone number I don't fucking think so sunny bubbles <laughs> so this shit was going on all the time you wouldn't know what's going to happen next with him he wanted to borrow my truck one Saturday night or one Saturday through to Sunday and I said oh yep yeah, you can do that a bit later in the week he's saying oh do you want a 400 amp welder no I said I don't have that sort of power at home really you sure no right, okay what, how much you want for Oh, I don't know. Not much. Well, you could come and stand watch for it if you want. And what do you mean stand watch for us? Oh, we're going to rumble the Tamuka sawmill. Oh, are you? Is that what you want the truck for? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh yeah. <laughs> I said, no, you're not getting my truck either. You know, turns out Tamuka sawmill, it was all over the radio, got rumbled on the bloody Saturday night. So you did it, did you? No, what are you talking about? I said, Tamika Sawmill was robbed there on Saturday night. They've taken a bloody safe, the gas plant. They used the gas plant to cut the safe out. The bloody wall, the welders are gone, chainsaws are gone. Well, that would have been a bit embarrassing if two turned up at the same time to do it. One of these is, you know. Bloody sure he did do it, but, you know, you wouldn't even know. Apart from the fact he tried to sell me a brand new steel, or near new steel chainsaw about a week or two later. I'm guessing it was probably one of them. But, yeah, so um, it was always, you just wouldn't know what's going to happen next down there. But um, it certainly, um, bloody, that history with the cops went on for a long time. Like even, I think it was, so this was back 1980, 1994, I get a ring from the cops. Um, Omaru cops saying, I'm a known associate of Ian Boyd's. Could you please, if we describe a device to you, would you be able to tell us what's this? Oh, fuck. <laughs> What's the device? I said, they go on to explain this device. And I said, well, did it go off? And um, no, I said, it's not his. Oh, why not? I said, well, he doesn't have duds. <laughs> and um, it was a bomb found under the house of somebody who um, he had a grief with. And um, and I talk, we we're talking about length of fuse. And I said, how much fuse did it have? And he saw about 18 inches. No, it's not his. I said, he uses six inches of fuse. Oh, so I've had six inches taped beside the 18 inches. What do you think that would be? He's, I said, he's trying to scare the shit out of someone. <laughs> well, he did a good job. So it turns out it might have been his. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, so as I said, it's, it's just those stories you go on for fucking ever. But, um, so um, firewood, we um, ended up finishing up. And um, now we've got to get the wee tractor, the tractor home and the car home. And I bought another little TK Bedford while I'm down there. So time to come home. It's going to be a convoy. So the tractor really was possibly overloading for the little Bedford a wee bit. But I thought, oh, we'll just try it on and see how it looks. So I went down to the neighbour's loading, loading bank and run it on. And Hillary says, you're not, are you? And I said, I think I might be. And so we chucked some shit on around the tractor, tied her on, and home we come. And that truck went well all the way. She was bloody good. So we left Tamuka, I think, in oh, about five o'clock in the afternoon. And we pulled into the old man's place at um, Clark Valley at half past four in the morning. So it was a pretty good run for her. Yeah. And I thought um, coming up the straight towards uh, Weka Pass from the turn off at Waikari, I thought I'll just give it some hoof coming up here and um, Alan was following behind in the little TK bed with the furniture in it and Hillary behind the wee mini and I buried my boot going up there and I saw the headlights on the little TK getting smaller and smaller and smaller and she, it was going well, like the t even the wee TK wouldn't keep up with us so I thought it was really improved at chucking that motor in so that was quite an eventful trip, it didn't have any scares much at all on it until coming down the Hope Saddle it's nose downhill and the tractor 
sort of the weight took over on one of the corners. I thought she was going to flop over there, but we got around it.